Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 13 of the podcast, and it's the 30th of March, 2016, as I record this intro. In this episode, Ann Oman, Anna Brown, and I answer listener questions. And I want to take a moment to thank you guys for sending in such thoughtful ones. Whether you're still considering the move to unschooling or have been unschooling for years and are coming upon new phases as your children get older, I love the openness to learn and the love for your children that comes shining through every question. So thank you. And remember, if you'd like to submit a question, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. As for my update on life around here, this week's highlight has probably got to be the ice storm and our three-day power outage. We don't lose power that often anymore, but ice storms are definitely a repeat culprit. We have a pretty good system developed. Uh, Down comes our basket of flashlights, candles, and matches. And in an act of lovely serendipity, we had picked up a new generator to replace our old one just a couple of days before the storm hit. This one starts so easily. Its priority is uh, powering the sump pump in the basement to avoid flooding. That happened to us once, and we learned from it. We were also able to use it to charge our phones and go back and forth between keeping the fridge cold and watching some TV. Plus, the wood stove kept us warm. We even collected melting ice water to flush the toilets and cook dinner on the barbecue, so we were good. I got a lot of lovely reading done, and Michael and I played Starflux and Dominoes by Candlelight in the evenings. And I have yet to beat him. <laughs> This week, I want to share a quote from Anne Oman. She writes, Because real natural learning is in the living. It's in the observing, the questioning, the examining, the pondering, the breathing, the choosing, the reading, the playing, the doing, the being, the loving, the joy. It's in the joy. I just love this quote because it takes us on the entire unschooling journey in three sentences. Give it a try. You start by truly seeing things, pulling away the conventional filters and questioning whether they're useful. Then you examine and ponder what you find, breathe through the challenges to your existing paradigms. You begin making choices that work for you and extend that to your children. You see them learning all the time in their activities, playing and discovering. You realize that learning is so ubiquitous, you no longer feel driven to look for it, and you settle into doing things and take the time to sink into being. You realize that loving relationships lie at the root of it all, and then that all is well when you and your children are seeking joy. The heart of unschooling is in the joy. And I think you'll feel that undercurrent in all our answers this episode. If you have anything you'd like to add, head on over to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and share in the comments for episode 13. Now, let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm here with Ann Oman and Anna Brown. Hi, guys. Hello. (laughs) They're here to answer listener questions with me again. And remember, if you'd like to submit a question for a future episode, just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the link. And just before we get started, um, we had some questions about the upcoming Childhood Redefined Summit. So I thought Ann and I would take a minute to talk about it. So do you want to say something, Ann? Yes. First of all, I'm very excited, as you know, and Pam is excited also. Very much. (laughs) And what's really exciting to me about the whole thing is that it's a brand new kind of unschooling gathering. And when Pam and I first started talking about it together, um, we decided to call it an unschooling summit. And the first thing that came to us is because this is where we want the energy to be. We want the energy to be up the highest point, the summit. And we uh, we both agreed on that right off the bat. 
And also that's the place that we want to help people to get to, to reach for their highest point in really getting unschooling, their highest point in their relationship with their children, their highest point in feeling good about themselves as unschooling parents. And we also kind of threw around the word intensive because it really describes the weekend well. It's the reason why it's an adult-only gathering, because our time together will be utilized in a way that connects us to each other as we take this journey together. And we'll be deeply connecting to ourselves, taking an honest look at where we are, what we believe, what we're holding on to, what we can let go of. And ultimately, the biggest payoff is how all of our time together, everything we're doing, the play, the conversations, the digging and the climbing, it all connects us to our children because it's them that we're holding on to in our hearts as we take this journey. And this Unschooling Summit is most definitely a journey to a new way of seeing and celebrating them, the children. That's our tagline. Journey with us to a new way of seeing your child. That still gives me goosebumps. I thought I would just give a quick overview of the schedule so people would have an idea of what to expect over the weekend. Um, Friday night is about meeting the tribe and connecting with the people that we're going to be spending the weekend with. Um, Anne and I will be doing extended intros and setting up the summit so that everyone knows what to expect. And then we'll be having a lot of fun together, hanging out and making art for the night. Yay! Saturday will be an amazing and, as Anne mentioned, intensive day. Anne's going to start us off with her session, The Depths of Radical Unschooling, where she'll dig deep into how redefining childhood means moving away from society's predetermined agenda for our children's lives and truly seeing, honoring, and celebrating them for being who they are. Then I'm going to dig into the flow of unschooling days, exploring how unschooling weaves into our lives by walking through an ordinary unschooling day. Children are wired to explore their world, curious, creative, and learning all the time. And when we don't get sidetracked by conventional parenting paradigms, that delightful approach to living will continue into their teen and young adult lives. And then in the next session, together we're going to dive into the things that can get in our way, the blocks that we bump up against that can make unschooling more challenging. Anne and I are going to share some of ours, and we'll explore those that are shared by other attendees. And then in the last session for the day, uh, the view from unschooling will open up things even more, asking which aspects of unschooling the attendees still have questions about to make sure that everyone has their questions addressed. In between those sessions, we're going to be having snacks, we'll have a meal, there'll be play breaks. And in those breaks, we're going to explore fun ways to connect with what we're learning on an even deeper level. And then in the evening, we're going to have our summit celebration. Yay! (laughs) On Sunday, uh, we're going to focus on living what we've learned. In our morning session, we'll be playing with an unschooling parent's job description so that attendees can take home concrete ideas for connecting more deeply with their family every day. And then in the afternoon, we're hosting a Make and Play Expo where we'll have hands-on activities for all attendees to have fun. Because many of us have forgotten how to play, which can make connecting with our kids more challenging. So after spending the weekend redefining the deep value of childhood, let's see if we can ignite the joy of play in the safe space that we've cultivated together with our summit tribe. And any families who've tagged along for the weekend are welcome to join us there too. So we also just wanted to let you know that registration closes at the end of day on Sunday, April 3rd. So if you're interested in joining us, don't wait. And if you have any questions uh, on our website, childhoodredefined.com, there's email addresses for Ann and I, and you're welcome to send us anything. I just got All right. more excited. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it sounds uh, wonderful. Yay. And you're going to be there too, right, Anna? Yes, yes. Yay. All right, let's get on to the questions then. Our first question today is from Sonia. She writes, I'm currently unschooling my five-year-old son and we are both enjoying it, though the thought of needing to go back to work in the near future keeps coming up. Any thoughts on what I can do to prepare myself to do both, financially support and unschool? So I'm going to start with this one. Um, Sonia didn't mention whether or not she's on her own. Uh, If there's a partner... 
Uh, one thing that I've seen considered and done quite a bit um, is to choose shift work so that one of you will be usually be home uh, with your with your son or with their children. Um, whether it's alternating shifts or, or one, you know, works uh, more evening shifts. And I know some like nurses who take uh, overnight shifts more regularly. So if there's a way that you can um, get into shift work and balance that with your partner, that would be cool. Um, then there's the option about working from home. If you've got any digital skills or you're interested in picking them up, there's lots of freelancer sites now out there that help match people up with projects. I've used them. We use them for the Summit logo, right? I've used them for book covers and, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, software developers, there's a lot uh, of project-oriented work out there that you can do on your own from home. Um, even if you find yourself needing some focused work time at home, you can look for uh, someone, else, another person who your child enjoys and hire them just for the express purpose of playing with your child during those hours a week where you need some focus time and to be able to, you know, address any of their needs. Basically, like what I did there was just try to think of this as another parameter in your lives that you're wanting or needing to accommodate and brainstorm tons of creative ideas. So I know of lots of parents actually who try to work from home when they can. They take their child with them when they need to into work sometimes. Maybe they make other child care arrangements, friends, somebody coming in, family for those unavoidable times when uh, when you need that. And the other thing is to look to your child for clues. That's where you're going to see whether or not it's working well. And and if it's not, that's not the end of the world. You just look for uh, other ways to change it up. You just uh, try brainstorm ideas, try one you think will work, see how it works out, and, and adjust along the way because things are, are going to change over months and years as well. So, Anna, Anna, anybody else got anything to add? I, I think what you said is really, really perfect. And that's kind of the mindset you have to be in for unschooling anyway, where you're just coming up with possibilities for uh, your lives, you know, and this happens to be your life that you need to come up with possibilities for while everybody else has different things, you know, so I, I think your suggestions are good and to just keep keep an open mind and be creative and uh, the brainstorming thing means coming up with as many things as you can because in there there may be answers I agree and really I think again it's just about that connection so it's going to be making sure you're connected with your child to see how is it working what do we need to change up what can we do what can we add and and I know the friends that I have here locally that are working and doing it it's about that great community too, finding those resources for yourself and for your child that's cool. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you got community around you too. And that question leads nicely into this one. This is an anonymous question. Um, the person writes, I'm homeschooling an only child. My son is almost nine. I work part time outside of the home, 30 hours a week. My husband takes over the homeschooling on the two days I'm gone all day. My son is introverted and prefers to be home and play alone or with mom and dad, draw or watch videos most of the time. His seven-year-old cousin comes over sometimes and they play, but mostly he's a loner and loves to be with me and his dad. We do go on outings as a family, but he's not interested in activities with other homeschoolers. As you can see, he's not very social, but he's kind, considerate, curious, and happy. I don't want to force him to interact with others, but do you have any suggestions of types of activities he might enjoy so that he could have friends? Do you want to start with this one, Anne? Sure, I would love to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love your question and how it is so full of his shine. I mean, you're saying he is kind, considerate, curious, and happy. And that is so beautiful. And you also have in there a bunch of buts. Um, so I not don't think your question is so much um, what activities he might enjoy, but maybe how you can shift your perspective to see it a different way, to use words that you can get behind and celebrate about him. Um, and that's, again, that's what we do with, with unschooling. We, we're redefining everything. For instance, what's your definition of a friend? Um, you, I, 
you say that he's uh, your good friends, and that is absolutely perfect and wonderful. Society has us trained to call everybody else friends and not our parents. And uh, in my family, we are best friends with our kids, and we always have been. We enjoy each other's company above anybody else. And that's our definition of a friend, and that's good enough. And what is your definition of a loner? You know, there's negative connotations to that because your questions. So take a look at that and see if you can drop that word. And you do say he is an introvert. And introvert, it's a really cool time to be an introvert, actually, because it yeah. does, it's, it's like the up and coming thing that's getting attention. And people are learning to celebrate that and how our society does need introverts. We can't all be extroverts. And so a shift into viewing that um, is really necessary because with all of these things that you're describing as a part of who your child is, what we can do is create a life that celebrates these things instead of trying to steer the children away from these things because they're all wonderful things. You know, when you look at that part of your sentence, um, he's kind, considerate, curious, and happy. So, okay, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Anna? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, just agree with all of that because I, I think <laughs> it is just so important to just under, you know, to value. And the only thing I, I guess I want to add to it and to really build off of what she said is I do think people have a lot of cultural expectations. It's the big birthday parties or the big, large homeschooling groups if you're in a bigger city or that type of thing. And those things are wonderful. And for some children, they work really well. And for some children, they don't work at all. And for me personally, they don't work at all. <laughs> I'm not a big birthday party person, you know, and that was the way it was for my kids. So I think just realizing we're different and, and different things serve us. And so to let go of this picture or cultural idea and really listen to your child. And, and just like Anne said, kind, considerate, curious and happy, like, oh my gosh, who wouldn't just be thrilled with that? <laughs> you know, that's so <laughs> wonderful that he's feeling so comfortable in his own skin and he's enjoying the people in his life. And, you know, I love all of that. And, and I guess just in terms of a practical situation, what we found being a family of introverts is where we really met people was when we were pursuing what we loved. And then those people came into our lives in surprising ways, people of different ages, people of different backgrounds, because we were just doing something we enjoyed and that attracted people that enjoyed the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention too was often when I'm asking myself questions or thinking there's something I need to fix for my child. Like, you know, I want him to have more friends or I think he or she should have more friends. I try to remember to flip the question around from their perspective. So if, is your son interested in finding more friends? Is he actually looking for more friends or is just this something that you're projecting onto him or wishing for him? So it's always good to take your child's perspective in those situations uh, and see whether this is something they're actually interested in. I will agree, I, other than going to the odd homeschooling conference, unschooling conference here and there, my kids weren't interested in activities that were organized for homeschoolers either. I mean, I think we went once to a play. Mm -hmm. And after spending 45 minutes waiting outside to get our tickets handed to us, you know, because they were a group purchase, and then walking in, it's like, no, you know what, if I pay a couple more bucks so we can go when we want to want to go when it fits into our schedule and everything, you know, because as Anna alluded to, um, unschooling itself isn't an interest of my children's. It's just the way they live their lives. So connecting with other people who are homeschooling or unschooling doesn't mean that they're going to develop any sort of friendship or connection. So when we were looking for those things, it was always better uh, um, for us to do things that we were interested in, find people through connections, uh, make connections with people through activities that they were all interested in. That was always a, a much more effective place to try and start a friendship. Definitely. All right. So, yeah. Can I, Go ahead. I think that the, the thing about um, redefining her definition of social and everything, because mm -hmm. I'm sure he's very mm -hmm. social with the parents and with anybody else he's you know, feel safe with and everything. And um, when I talked about creating life around these things, that's what you said, you know, we don't have to do it with the groups, you know, you go from their interest, and then you create the life 
from that and what makes them comfortable. Yep, exactly. And and when you're always looking at it from their perspective, you're going to see whether or not they are interested in those kinds of things. Like I know um, my eldest, he has lots of connections, but they're they're online. And for the longest time, he was perfectly happy. I mean, with a brother and a sister and two parents around, that was a lot of people that you were uh, in front of every single day. You know, that was that was totally enough for him. Well, in unschooling families, have conversations about everything. You know, we we kind of explore the world in our conversations and everything. And that's um, for my kids. It was what that's what they loved. And if somebody else made it, their world feel smaller, they didn't want to connect with them at all. You know what I mean? They already had right. these connections where we're you know talking about wonderful things and everything. So that's very satisfying and fulfilling for them, and checks off being friends basically. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. Question number three is from Marcella. She writes, I'm looking for tips to support my always unschooled 18 year old. He is interested in art and has made a goal to work on his drawing skills every day. He is very introverted and he's not interested in taking any classes at this time. He took some community college classes recently and excelled in them, but decided not to take any more. My husband and I are excited that he's passionate about art and fully support how he's spending his days now. He's a happy guy and finds joy in video games, drawing, watching anime, and spending time with his girlfriend. I worry, though, that he's a little stuck or overwhelmed about taking steps to grow and learn. He's never had a job and has not had interest in getting his driver's license. I don't want to pressure him, but want advice and maybe reassurance about how to help him take the next steps when he's ready. And Anna, how about you start? I feel like we probably all have so much to say about this. I know. <laughs> I have three pages of notes. I know. Because I'm thinking this is Anne and this is everybody. So, yeah. Um, I'll just say, like, what immediately came to mind to me is, is the mantra piece that I've talked about before, which is there's, there's plenty of time. And, you know, mm-hmm. there isn't a certain timetable. It doesn't need to look a certain way. And, and I think what I've seen my kids are 16 and 18 is that um, it is an overwhelming time. Like they're, you know, figuring out who they are and all of these different things. And I think culturally we kind of push teens past their readiness. And I think, you know, we see the backlash from that and, and, in you know, teens and young adults that are upset and don't know what's happening in their life and alcohol issues and all of those things. And what I love about our life is this beauty of unfolding, you know, just letting it go. And and what we've seen are starts and stops, you know, this big leap ahead and do to do. And then, hey, I want to come back and think about what I've just done and process that. And then, OK, now I want to try this and come back. And so I love that beautiful dance into adulthood that unschooling has given us the opportunity for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll pop in next. Um, there is something in in society about this mis- mystical number of 18, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> because traditionally, parenting wisdom, it tells us that we have an 18-year window to mold our children into competent adults, or we failed. And this narrative is even bigger than school. So it does take a lot of work and reassurance, I think, to get through it. So I, I think it's really great, Marcella, that you realize that it may just be reassurance that you're looking for. Because um, coming to unschooling, we shift our perspective about learning from being focused on childhood to being a lifelong activity. And it becomes glaringly apparent that we continue to grow and change as a person even after we turn 18. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at ourselves at mm-hmm. 50. <laughs> Uh, Some children definitely will have a more uh, concrete path at around that age or even earlier, and some will still be exploring all sorts of things, um, you know, well beyond 18. It's it's a human thing. It's life. It's living. It's personal. You know, it's not about school or even, you know, unschooling per se. It's it's life. Um, I want to mention maybe if you've had a chance to listen to the uh, podcast episode I did with Idzi. La, the last episode we had, we talked about some of that as well. 
So, I mean, if you think he might be feeling a bit stuck, just, you know, make a little bit of extra effort to make sure he's surrounded by people who love and support him. And you've got a, a nice, comfy uh, environment for him to cocoon for this while, while he works his way through it. And just make sure, um, ask yourself, make sure you, that you're open so that if he makes any overtures for conver- open up for conversation or, you know, can we do this or whatever, that you're especially receptive so that you can help him so Support him as he's putting feelers out and and trying new things, but either way, it, it's good where he is. It sounds it sounds wonderful. Go Anne. <laughs> I would love to dig in a little deeper if we could. Um, sure. I had <laughs> um, my two sons. Jacob's now twenty five. Sam is almost twenty two. Jacob is one who could always um, feel and express when he was stuck and in fact so many times in his life that word just wouldn't leave his mind as he would do his jobs or whatever he was doing normally at a job at the library shelving books one day and he just came home like i just had the word stuck in my head all day long and so that was easy jacob knew he was ready for more and he was open to possibilities and they just flowed in to us with him because he was ready, he was ready to cross the threshold, and um, that's when things flow. And when you identify that with your within yourself, with Sam, he tends to stay in his world of familiar and safe and excelling at the things that he loves to do right where he is. And um, even though he may be ready to expand. It takes a big push from the universe for him to do that and to um, get outside of his comfort zone. And it's never a push from his family. It all comes from within himself and his own fear and his uh, recognizing that it's fear. And so these are, you know, two totally different uh, kids and conversations that we've had. And um, with Sam, it's just been Uh, of course, honoring where he is, and yet validating his kind of antsiness and his frustration and everything. I agree with everything you guys said that, um, you know, when the time is right, um, they'll know it and they're ready. And I've never believed that we've had to jump on opportunities when they're right in front of us, because honoring that we're not ready allows that to come back later, an opportunity to come back later in a different form, something that's even more perfect. When we're more ready, something even more perfect will show up. But there have been times with um, Sam that I have had to honor um, myself within what I am doing to help him. And that's uh, the biggest one was with him getting his driver's license because I was driving him to his job at the restaurant and he wasn't getting done till like 1130 at night. And I am a morning person. And um, not only that, I would have I would sit there at downtown in our college town, surrounded by drunk college students while I'm waiting for him. It was very it was very uncomfortable for me. And um, I did it with love and because to support Sam. And then I got to the point where I knew I was denying what myself and I needed to talk to him about what I needed. So that's what we did. And that was a very emotional conversation because I tend to wait too long (laughs) before I speak, before I speak up for myself. But, um, and again, it was the driver's license thing of, and it was fear. And, um, it's so understandable that fear because they're in this life where they're celebrated and doing what they love and being nurtured and encouraged and everything. And to cross over that threshold, you've got to take a test. You've got to, you know, um, do things that you're not used to doing, being judged by other people for your work and your performance. So to validate that is really, really important. And also, I believe with Sam, there are other factors that, um, again, he's not one to speak about how he feels. So I believe the factor that he would be responsible for driving himself to work himself and we wouldn't have the conversations in the car on the way home and everything. And so that conversation led into uh, if I were home 
and he came home, I would be so happy to get up <laughs> and go out and see him, which I did once he got his license and came home. And that was such a great connecting time, even better, because he wasn't just like getting out of work full of, you know, frustrated, whatever, and he would have time to ponder the things on his way home. So basically, for me, it's being a matter of being students of our children and feeling out what they're feeling. And if they are not good at articulating um, their feelings, then we've really got to just kind of come up with possibilities and to open discussion and help them. And I, I believe validation is just huge because it's totally understandable that there's fear there to, um, to want to do something different, but staying in the place of stuckness if in fact they are feeling stuck. Yeah, oh, that was great. <laughs> Okay, question number four. This question is from Anne. She writes, how to unschool without it turning into watching cartoons all day. My daughter used to go to the library and we'd pick out books together, but now she's nine and has figured out about DVDs. All she wants are DVDs of movies that I don't really want her watching. Also, we don't have a TV, but she can find any cartoon or show she wants on the internet, and short of turning off the internet, it's hard without immense power struggles to get her to limit what she's, what she watches and how long. Okay, I'll start off with this one. Um, I think first it helps to be clear on what we're doing. You mentioned that you are struggling to get her to limit what she watches and how, but you know, let's take take on our own uh, perspectives and really you're the one who wants the her, wants the limiting to be done, not her. You know, she's not uh, wanting to limit herself, I assume from from the way you've written the question. So, you know, realize that this is this is just about you. It's not about getting her to do something. Um, and then I think it can really help to dive into yourself and why you want to limit something that she enjoys and why is it that you don't want her to watch, watch certain things. You know, this is all going to be all about digging into your beliefs and your understanding and, and your feelings. Um, the things that she's drawn to are going to help you learn more about the person that she is, as opposed to getting her to be the person that you wish she was by controlling her choices. So maybe you can do a little perspective switching here and um, see that your wishes, uh, the things that you're wanting to control for her are really um, controlling tr a way to try and control the person that she is versus uh, if you were to try and dive into these interests with her, I think you will learn so much more about her and you'll understand her choices so much better. So it won't be like, oh, she's watching any cartoon or show. No, when you start seeing what particular cartoons and shows and stuff that she's watching, you're going to start to see threads between them. You're going to start to see what she finds interesting. So I think that could be really fun for you. So seeing our children clearly and supporting and even celebrating them for the things that they enjoy go a long way to minimizing those in immense power struggles that you're talking about. So if you can spend some time with her while she's watching without judgment, not even in your body language, and see what she loves and feel the joy that she's feeling, that I think that's going to be a great place for you to start. Um, you can also... Uh, episode number two with Pam Shrushin, we talked about this at length uh, as well. Um, the whole um, withholding um, TV or, or whatever it is. Um, we had a great discussion about that there. So you might want to listen to that as well. Anna? I, I, yes, yes, yes. I really, I mean, <laughs> I, I just want to say the same things because I, I think for me, it's just that trusting, like being excited about whatever they're digging into, because I think it's really human nature to kind of dive into something and explore it. And you're right. When you're looking up here, it's like, oh, it looks like they're just doing this watching thing. But no, when you understand what they're doing and you watch the shows, you do see the connections and you see what they're interested in and, and maybe it's the comedy of it or the drama of it or whatever it is. Um, and I've also seen in some local families where things were limited, be it games or candy or TV, 
there is some kind of binging that happens <laughs> when they when it's released because there's a fear, there's a lack, you know, they're going to take it away. They're not, you know, and so what I saw in those cases when people really changed that paradigm, the children began to trust and then they they really were pursuing it because they loved it and it and then sometimes they let things go because they've done it and they moved on. But I think when we set those artificial limits, it, we are changing that natural flow. And so, you know, I just really caution against that. And the only other thing that's come up a lot on the list that we talk about is, again, really what Pam said is to look at yourself to say, what's happening here with me? And maybe it's that she's feeling disconnected because in the question, she said, you know, we used to go together to the library and read books together. And so now, you know, this is happening without her. So I think certainly one answer is to join in with her and watch the shows, but it also may just be a conversation, you know, what can we find that we love that we could do together still? And it may be different than what it was as our kids grow and change, but, you know, honoring that it's about connection versus judging what the, how the person's spending their time just really changes that whole flow of the conversation. And yes, definitely. And uh, what I always kind of like to picture is the parents jumping in with the child in a really big way, you know, um, not a tolerating way <laughs> beyond yeah. accepting and, you know, watch the shows with her, find out what she loves about it. Use that for your joyful connection. Um, and does she want a TV to watch her shows? You know, maybe expand on that even. Uh, the biggest thing is your, your last sentence. It's hard without immense power struggles to get her to limit what she watches and how long. Any, I, nothing in that sentence, sentence is anything we want to invite into our lives and into our relationship with our child. So that's a huge thing to just watch out for, as Pam and Anna have said also. And there's so much value, as they've said, that you're missing out on by wanting it to go away. And when you jump in in a huge way, joyfully, and you can get to that authentic place, you will see how one interest, even one that um, society does not define as having value, of course, we unschoolers do because we have seen we've seen how they grow into so many other things, so many other interests. There's tangents everywhere, and all of a sudden you'll see them everywhere, and the learning will uh, expand beyond this interest immensely. But the key is to not look for or wait for that, because the key is to get to the place of loving and celebrating her for who she is in this moment. And what she loves to do is a part of who she is. So definitely start there and join her there. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, question number five is from Emily. Uh, she writes, I have a question about strewing or the idea of bringing new interesting ideas or interests into my kids' lives. I feel like I do a good job supporting their current interests, but I'm not sure I'm bringing in enough extra to create opportunities to find new interests. How did this look on your unschooling journey? You want to start, Anna? Sure. I mean, it's funny, as Anne was finishing up her answer to the last question, I was like, oh, it's this too, because I, I mean, really every interest just you know a tv show that seems like oh it's just a tv show no it's never just a tv show it always mm -hmm. leads to so many discussions or this or there's a history piece or there's a comedy piece or there's a something piece that gets us started and, and digging and and i think something else we talked about too is just how many discussions happen in unschooling households we're talking about things all the time things we've seen things we're doing things we saw on the news things we saw on the internet things our friends said you know, whatever, talking, talking, talking. And I think all of that just leads to the next interest. And so I think just as unschooling parents, it's really just about being open and being available and listening. And, you know, when I'll see we have a big discussion and ooh, this interest is sparked, uh, you know, I'll start looking stuff up and I'll say, oh, look what I found. And then they'll start looking stuff up and look what I found. And it becomes this sharing with each other. So I think it really is very organic, that process of just new things coming into our life because of what we're doing at the time and enjoying. Yeah. 
Yes, I, I completely agree. I found the best things to bring into my kids' lives were those that were springboarded from the things that they already love. And exactly what you said, Anna. And I always talk about expanding our children's worlds. And that doesn't mean it can't be done within the framework of what they already love and what they're interested in. As I said before, there's so many paths from just one interest. And Pam had a flow chart describing everything from one interest. <laughs> you, Pam. Put that on the website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's up. I'll put links. I'll put links to that in the show notes. Yeah, because that was one of the things I want. I have here in my notes as well. I'm not sure that I brought much into their lives that wasn't at least tangentially related to an right. interest or or to the being, like you know who they were, things I knew they were predispositioned to enjoy. So I think maybe it comes down to high how wide you look to support their current interests and and. As you guys have said, you know, I, I too went pretty wide. So let's just give an example for a love of, of video game music because Joseph loves, um, you know, the soundtracks even for video games. Um, so that that meant that when I noticed there was a concert of gaming music coming to Toronto, I mentioned it to him. Now, we didn't go. That was fine. Um, some of us enjoyed, I think, Anne, you originally introduced us to Flight of the Concords. Um, so when I shared that they were coming to town to do a, a show, um, I asked around and we did it. Some of us did end up going to that. So, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's tangential. It's, it's anything, you know, related basic, you know, to just any little piece, the piece that you, that you think that they're enjoying out of it. So what I did, you know, just to know these local happenings and stuff that were going on around us, you know, I signed, maybe signed up for email lists, um, for websites of the, the things that they enjoyed. Like, you know, I'm on the NASA mailing list now, the shuttle, uh, shuttle, the rocket launches and stuff. We, we timed one of our vacations to Florida a couple years ago around a launch, at the Kennedy Space Center. And we went went to that, you know. It's just mm -hmm. finding all those little pieces. It, it's just, um, you know, connecting myself to the kinds of interests that they, my children have. Because, I mean, most office, I, often I find them interesting as well. I thought that was super cool. It was lots of fun. <laughs> and when they were younger, it was things like, you know, browsing toy stores or, or the mastermind store. We used to love that. Um, and maybe I'd check out stacks of books at the library and bring them home and, and uh, they would go through them or not. I would, I was signed up for, we had a science center membership. So I would get emails from them about new exhibits. And if things came up that were particularly interesting, I'd be sure to mention those. Um, even even searching eBay was fun for, you know, whatever they were interested in at the time, because often um, we can find uh, things from around the world, whereas, you know, they weren't in our local stores and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it was that was just the fun thing is just keeping kind of my feelers out, knowing what was out and about in the world. But it was all connected in some way to some sort of interest that that they had at the time. That's very true, um, us too. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that we do bring stuff into their lives that um, that we love. Uh, that yeah. happens because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, I've gone to see Broadway shows with me that I've loved and, you know, uh, other things. We, when we are living full lives ourselves, we can't help but bring stuff in. And um, the funny thing is, it doesn't stick with them unless they're really wanting it to stick. And that's not what we look for, you know? And so it's like, I have proof right here that <laughs> bringing stuff in and, and with strewing things, we can bring in fun things that we want, they want to play with and everything. But um, for the most part, it's from their interests. And I just had an example come to my head when we went to see um, these Irish step dancers. I wrote about this in one of my, conference talks and the woman who was step dancing her she had two daughters also step dancing and she had told us the story about how when she her kids were little she went to see step dancing and she thought I want my kids to do that and I was just I could not believe anybody would just come out and <laughs> say that <laughs> how can you think of look at something that you are interested in and think I want my kids to do that no, no. <laughs> 
And so, and that was obvious by the way the kids were acting during the performance because they were just like off to the side, goofing around. They weren't, you could tell they were not passionate about Irish step dancing. <laughs> they were probably forced to do it. So um, that's the thing. And, you know, Sam knows all the 70s songs and the words. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's because I listen to 70s songs, but it has more value, no value in his life, really, except for having the reference. So um, it's a wonderful, you know, swirl of information and things coming into our lives because of what we all love to do. Um, but mostly if we're strewing for the children, it's exactly what you guys have been saying. Yeah, that's true. I because no, we're not living in a vacuum. Each of us are also right. encountering what the rest of our family's interested in, and extended family too, right? Yeah, exactly. And now, question six. It's a question from Lauren. She writes, "I love listening to your podcasts. Thanks, Lauren. I'm hoping this question can be asked during an upcoming roundtable discussion." I began unschooling my almost nine-year-old son this year, and I have been in awe of the unfolding happening in myself through the deschooling process. It is like I am seeing where my own thinking has been limited, and I am opening to so many new joyful possibilities and ways of being with my son. Unschooling for us so far is so much more about our connection and relationship than I ever realized before beginning this journey, and it's really just beautiful and exciting. In addition to witnessing learning happening everywhere and getting to see my son blossom through this process, our increased closeness and relationship has been one of the most wonderful benefits of choosing unschooling for me. What have been some of your favorite aspects of unschooling that you maybe didn't realize would be part of the process until you were living it? Are there any stories you'd like to share of your unschooling joys and delights? And thanks for all the wonderful work you do. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. And would you like to start, Anne? I would love to. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for the wonderful work you do. I was just listening to Pam read your question, smiling, because your question shows the beautiful work you are doing. And that's perfect. Um, for me, I knew from the beginning that this was my journey and that Jacob would lead me simply by being who he is and that I would learn from celebrating that about him. And my favorite part is how I have seen and proven and how I keep on learning about how magical life is and how all we want and need is waiting for us when we're living in that pocket of honoring our children and ourselves and following the thumbs up signs from the universe, which leads to more, more yes paths, which opens more doors. And again, I kind of always knew that um, life could be like this. And when I was pregnant and people would say, you know, stuff like, oh, aren't you tired? Just wait till it's born. You'll be so tired then. And then they'd say, oh, wait until he's two. You'll have your hands full then. And then they'd say, wait until they can talk back and wait until they're teenagers. And oh my God, I couldn't believe how society had a negative connotation for every stage of our children's lives. And <laughs> even before I gave birth to Jacob, I just knew that our family would be different. And because I knew that, we walked into creating that. And Jacob had his green light for showing us the way. The end. That. The end. <laughs> um, Anna? Well, I just want that to marinate just a minute because, oh my gosh, it's so important. And that was always such a pet peeve for me because I had a natural birth. And of course, they're like, oh, well, wait till you're in labor. And then it was, I thought, oh, that's behind me now. I had the natural birth that was behind me. Then it was like, wait till they're walking and talking to this. Oh my goodness. So difficult. But um, I, I just, so I love that just ability to celebrate each and every stage and all of our time together. And that's really the one that stuck out for me because it, it's hard to pick you know, wonderful moments, but I feel like it's boiled down to time, like our time together, our time to be, our time to explore and connect. And I feel like that connection has just gotten us through all, you know, the ups and downs that come with life. But there is a story, um, it's many years ago, the girls were little and David was out of town and we had had a rough day. And, and honestly, at this point, I don't remember what the rough day was about, but we've all had them. And it, it was bedtime and it was late already and tired and grumpy and just terrible energy all around. And I glanced out the window and I saw that it was this beautiful, crystal clear, starry night. 
And I said, I looked at grumpy girls and I said, you know what? I think we should put the blanket on the roof and look at the stars. And I was met with squeals of delight. (laughs) And so we did and we chatted and we laughed and the day's troubles really just melted away. And we went to bed super, super late that night and we all slept in the next morning. And, And sometimes I hear the bus picking up the kids across the street and it's often still dark outside. And that morning I remember hearing it and seeing the lights flashing and I was filled with gratitude for our super late night and my sleeping girls that were tucked into bed next to me. And I went back to sleep too. And I think it's that, it's that time. It's that time to make the choice in that moment to connect instead of feeling the pressures of, but we've got to get up in the morning. The bus is coming at six in the morning. I can't do this. We're tired. Let's go to bed, you know, and, and just all that can melt away. And so that's something that I just love about this life. And it has happened over and over and over again that's beautiful yeah (laughs) um for me i actually have been as the one who took my kids out of school and dove into de-schooling from there um i guess some of the big realizations i had were that that my children were really amazing people as they were and I didn't need to change them into some version I had in my mind or the school had in their mind or, you know, just all the conventional wisdom that told me I had to change them to some certain standard. I, as I spent more time with them as we were de-schooling, I saw just how amazing they were right now. Um, the realization that parenting isn't about getting them to adulthood, it's about building lifelong relationships with my family. Just as you mentioned, Lauren, the the beauty of the relationships that you develop was a surprise to me because at first it was, you know, school and learning isn't working well. I was bringing them home to learn and to realize so quickly that what was really at the heart of it was relationships was beautiful. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. And that if I just focus on building and maintaining the connection and trust in our relationship, absolutely everything else followed. All the learning, all the self-awareness, all the everything. It was just about the relationship. So um, stories that stick with me extra brightly, um, as as Anna alluded to, are really just ordinary moments in our days. So many small moments from the months that I brought Lissy coffee in bed almost every day and we would chat for an hour or so. Um, to the long and wandering conversations um, that I have with Joe in the kitchen and still do, to the calm, world, wordless connections with Mike that I have at busy karate tournaments. And, and as Anna's story said, the things that really stick out in my memory are often the challenging moments when one of the kids is having a particularly rough moment and I remembered to reach deep to be there for them and to actually be there with them. And I feel such joy looking back on those moments because we felt our way through them together. So that was that was a re- really cool piece of uh, the de-schooling process for me. Okay, let's move on to question number seven. This one's from Elizabeth. She writes, uh, hi, Pam, would you and your thoughtful panel share your experiences with parenting through your children's transition from young child to tween? My oldest is 10 and I've watched him mature in some big ways during the past year. I've been enjoying having an abundance of time with him so much and watching him grow thanks to our unschooling lifestyle. I have noticed recently, though, that I'm missing him as part of his growing maturity also means growing independence. He is old enough and mature enough now to choose to stay home when his younger sister and I go out. He joyfully calls goodbye as we leave and happily welcomes us when we return. And I'm glad that he is able to have that quiet time to just be by himself. But I miss him. So I'm not sure if you all experienced that beautiful mix of emotions, gratitude and joy and loss when your children started transitioning from childhood to tweens, or if it was possibly later for you or earlier. But I'd love to hear about your feelings and thinking around this age and just about your children's growing independence in general. I'm going to start with this one. And uh, absolutely, I totally remember when Joseph began staying home as Lissy, Mike, and I would go out like uh, to the Science Center, to the Pioneer Village, to the parks, all over the place. 
And I remember specifically when I would feel his absence, the the work that I would do to move through it, I would remind myself how much he loved his time with the house to himself. And I looked back and I remembered how much I loved that growing up when it happened too. I loved having the our place to ourself, myself. Um, it helped me to realize that the kids were all gaining energies in ways that worked for each of us. So, you know, he was so refreshed when we came back, when he'd had some real quiet time in the home with himself. Um, and that he was learning what uniquely works for him and developing such a wonderful level of self-awareness that was going to serve him forever. You know, him having the opportunity to experience that and to understand what it meant to him was wonderful. And then when we got home, I'd be sure to be open to any connecting with me that he might be seeking out. So maybe to regale me with stories of what he was up to while he was gone or just how good he felt about how he loved when he, when he was alone in the house, you know, things like that, just to make sure that he didn't feel like he was being left out or anything. Um, Anna, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I, I have so enjoyed, you know, being a part of my children's life, the day to day life as they grow into adulthood. It, it's been such an amazing journey and I feel like it has happened so fast now that to some extent kind of <laughs> back at some of that. Um, from the days of constant togetherness to now independent travel and the the, the rarely but occasionally empty house <laughs> that feels very strange. Um, I think mostly it's been exciting for me to just watch them come into your own and kind of like you were saying, Pam, because I do remember back to, you know, being a teen and how cool that felt and how fun it was to have the house to yourself and to go out driving, you know, by yourself for the first time and to pick up your friends and that kind of thing. Um but I think like with other things we've talked about, there's these ebbs and flows. And that's one thing I really like about the connections we build with unschooling. There isn't this agenda or sense that, OK, now you're on your own. You know, instead, we're this foundation and we're connected and there's this returning, this ebb and flow, this needing to go check things out and be on your own and independent. And then, hey, wanting to come back and snuggle on the couch. And, and, and those moments are still there even into, you know, as we're approaching and now into adulthood. And of course, you know, Anne, and you can speak even more about that. Um, I do think for us, the tween time can be, and for, for other friends that I've had, an especially fraught time with hormones and big changes. And there's a wanting independence and then a not wanting it. And that back and forth, you know, changes kind of kept me on my toes. But, but again, that was, I'm so grounded in the gratitude for our lifestyle because I felt like it, it let those ebbs and flows happen. It gave us all peace and time to work with that and feel our way through it. And, and like you, Pam, it was like looking to see that we're all finding our way and finding what works for us, the time alone, the time with people, the, the how that, that goes, this independence that we want. But then the sometimes coming and talking to our, you know, trusted advisor and best friend about how we, what we want to do going forward. So I loved that time, but it, it is a time of emotion for all of us, I think, and just changes and, and all of that. But it, it's a wonderful time. Yeah. What I what I love about what you two are saying is that um, you're it's not about what they're doing. It's not about their choices. You're talking about the work that you've done to mm -hmm. um, allow them to continue to grow and feel nurtured and encourage them to do what their hearts are telling them to do. And that's really important. And part of that, I'm sure, is how I feel about um I have never felt like I've looked back and missed my kids when they were little, you know, younger anything, because we're so into living and celebrating um, them for who they are now that uh, it would be discounting who they are now if we look back and said, oh, I remember when they were little and I got to hold them and everything, you know, they're beautiful young adults and we're always, our whole lives are about living in this moment. So, yes, this is our perspective that needs to be shifted about it and to not make it about what they were doing. And it's up to us to go through this process ourselves and figure out um, how we want to see it. 
And the other point is that when they are home doing what they're doing and we do miss them, which I, I have done, you know, when we're in the same house, <laughs> and <laughs> I've just, you know, grabbed a snack or whatever and brought it into their room while they're playing video games and say, hey, I miss you. Can I hang out by you? I, you know, and that's the connection part that we get when going into their space and their joy and um, connecting with them in that way. And another thing, like when um, they were so into what they're doing and say I had to go to the grocery store or something, we would always have conversations about if we wanted to do something more besides go to the grocery store to include their possibilities of seeing the world. If they did want to get out but didn't want to go grocery shopping or whatever we were doing or, you know, something specific. So we would say, you know, what, what do you feel like? And you know, maybe we would talk about going to see a movie or something. And the purpose, again, is not to get them out of the house and not to get them away from what they were doing, because that's all perfectly wonderful, but kind of to expand our definition of what we're doing when we're out and offer possibilities to see, to make sure everybody gets what they want out of the, out of the day, I guess, out of our time that we have allotted for the day. Yeah, it's so much about possibilities, right? Yes. I think so. And, and something Anne said and something Anne said at other times, too. It's also just looking for those moments. It, it, it may look different at different ages, how you connect and what that looks like. It may be the car ride or the folding laundry or the walking the dogs or the doing those different things. And so it looks different, but it's just finding those opportunities for connection. And they're, they're always there. Yes, I had written a note about our folding laundry thing. Yeah. <laughs> the whole time my kids were growing up. And I mean, our favorite time of connecting is, like you're saying, when our hands are busy, you know, yeah. possibly doing yeah. something, and yet our hearts are free to connect. So from the time they were very little, I would say, I'm folding laundry. Do you want to come out and hang out by me? And to this day, they know that that means let's connect. I want to hear what's going on with you. And you know, whether they fold laundry or not, which they usually do, <laughs> but it's the, it's all about the connection. And, and that's the time when you, we get to talk and, um, it's, it's really precious. And there's, there's never any expectations in it from us either. That's the whole thing too. That's right. Cause I mean, when you're, you're feeling like you miss them, you're, you're the one looking for the connection, right? Exactly. There's no it. Yeah, there's no expectation that they're going to come to you to whatever, but you're going to be looking for openings to get that that connection with them and creating possibilities for it. That's exactly. so cool. Exactly. Okay, question number eight is from Cheryl. Cheryl writes, hi, Pam, my husband and I have been listening to your podcast and we start changing, have started changing our lives towards unschooling. While reading your book, I came across something that has been bugging me for a few days. In the chapter, Will This Work?, you say, when done well. This implies that there's a wrong way to unschool. I keep asking, how do you unschool? Maybe I should be asking, how do you unschool wrong or poorly? Maybe in your next Q&A, you could answer that for me. Okay, Anne, would you like to go first? Well, sure. Um, well, I'd love to have a back and forth conversation because there's so much to cover that I certainly have not written enough notes for it. And, um, but what, what came to me first is how important it is for us to learn to gauge our lives according to our children and how we feel about our connection and use that as our compass, um, so, you know, you, you do that. It's not, I, I have, I know somebody who thought unschooling what meant getting her housework done while the kids were, did their own thing. And that does not lead to the best parent child connection, obviously, nor the best sibling connections. Our presence is necessary, obviously. And we have this inner uh, mama intuition that can gauge if we are deeply connected to our children. And if not, then there's infinite possibilities of how to go forward and do that. Um, so, you know, how's your connection with your children? Are you living your life as if it's your job to be their partner, their advocate, their guide, their fountain of inspiration and information when they need and want it? Uh, another, another, um, guiding question would be, is your child's world rich with joy? And are you seeing that joy as the most valuable aspect of your unschooling lives? 
Um, are you actively and deliberately encouraging and nurturing your child's joy and interests and curiosities? Another thing that stuck out with me um, is your home filled with creative tools that your child loves to use to explore the world. Because I, I always think when I'm in a hotel room, I always think this is so boring. Have you ever been in a hotel room where you've just had to like wait for somebody or something to happen <laughs> and your spirit feels so stifled because there's nothing of you in that room and there's nothing, not much for you to be interested in or curious about. How many times can you read the menu? And <laughs> so your home should not be like a hotel room. Your home should be like a resource center for your children and um, your conversations also rich and passionate and interested and interesting and world expanding. And I, I, when people would ask us about our unschooling lives, I always, I don't know how true this is, but I, this was one of my answers <laughs> that I always gauged whether my kids worlds were bigger at home than they would be in school. And the answer was always obviously overwhelmingly. Yes, they're bigger at home. But if anybody can see that as a true gauge that, you know, then there's a need to expand the world at home. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. <laughs> I, I, that's why when our kids, kids are growing up, um, traveling anywhere, took so much luggage and everything, right? Because you were bringing things <laughs> with you <laughs> to make these rooms that, interesting. The minute I said that about the hotel room, I remember um, when we were in Niagara Falls checking out the hotel and there was that amazing lightning storm coming over and Lissy had her first camera and <laughs> she was taking pictures of that lightning storm coming over and it was, it was really cool and beautiful. And this is, this is unschoolers in a hotel room. You know what I mean? It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah I remember that. That was cool. Um, yes. A lot of what Anne said, one of the things that stuck out for me um, when you talk about unschooling being done poorly, I think that that can happen when parents get the impression um, that they should be staying more hands off that thinking children following their interests to learn means that they shouldn't be involved. Like I, I don't want to, um, you know, interfere my ideas in with their pursuing their interests, that it needs to be pure. Um, but as Anne was talking about that connection, that being together, that's how they're going to learn even more. You know, they're going to be not, and it's not only about the interests and and stuff that they're learning. Like when you're hands off, there is um, so much experience that your kids aren't getting about um, interacting with people, talking with people, understanding other people, um, you know, just, just learning how to uh, gain someone else's perspective and understand what they're feeling. And all that processing and talking helps their self-awareness grow, helps them understand themselves better. So there's just so much that um, doesn't come out when you try to stay hands off because you think you shouldn't be influencing them. If you're over influencing influencing them, you're, you're going to see that. If you look at your kids, they're going to be reacting to that. Um, so you're going to get clues when sometimes you get too involved because that happens too. But if you're scared of that happening and maybe the repair work that you'll need to do with your relationship at the time, if you're scared and you stay hands off, things aren't going to go any better anyway. Um, another piece um, is that really helps is being curious yourself. Um, live the unschooling lifestyle with them. This isn't something that you're doing to your children. Your children aren't unschooling. It's a, it's a lifestyle for your whole family to live. So as we talked earlier in the questions, that excitement about bringing your own interests into just, just the family conversation and everything, it's, it's all about the connection and, unschooling doesn't thrive as well when you, you're not deeply connected as a family all together. you have anything you'd like to add, Anna? 
Um, yeah, just a few things. Um, I, 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 not too long ago, we had someone joining the list, and, and one of the quotes in, in their joining letter was, we started off homeschooling, and then we got lazy and started to unschool. And <laughs> you know, it's not the first time that I've heard this concept of, you know, unschooling is the lazy or the easy way out. And so it is something that I talk about a lot when I'm talking about unschooling or talking to new people, unschooling, explaining that it's really the exact opposite. You know, unschooling is in engagement, it is connection, it is time, creativity, ingenuity, all of that. And it takes a lot of time for the connections that we're talking about. And it is not at all lazy and not at all this, you know, oh, this hands off that you're talking about. Whereas I think, you know, really traditional homeschooling, here's this curriculum, sit at the table, you go do that, really is that, you know, you've given away that responsibility. But with unschooling, you know, you're working together. It's a it's an everyday thing. It, it's a lot of work, joyful, joyful work, but work to really be aware and listening to your children and finding opportunities and researching and doing and helping them reach those goals. So, so that's an important piece of that when we talk about that. And I think there's also a piece of dropping old ideas or cultural ideas. You know, so often um, I see people who are, you know, talking about unschooling and their child will say, have an interest like, oh, look at that ballet dancer. That's neat. Or Lissy, oh, I, I'm kind of interested in photography. And then instantly they're enrolled in formal classes. <laughs> and I think what happens there is, you know, it's like, oh, look, they have an interest. We're going to enroll them in classes. You know, we're showing, oh, it has to be done this certain way. Whereas what we've seen, you know, is that really sometimes they just want to wear the tutu, you know, <laughs> sometimes they just want to dance around the room with you dancing with them. And sometimes like Lissy, they just want to go out in the woods and create stories and take pictures of it and let that grow. And that's not to say there may come a time when a formal class is, is, is the child's really saying, okay, this is, I want this next information. But I think there's some letting go of Oh, 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 this is what it looks like. This is what we have to do now. Look, they have an interest, you know, we're going to turn it into a class. And, and I think, um, it can happen too when, when parents set out to create co-ops, you know, and I think co-ops can be a beautiful thing, but we've also seen them kind of devolve into a list of courses. So, you know, this parent's going to offer history and this parent's going to offer this. And these kids are going to sit here for an hour for this class, an hour for that class. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm not sure that the kids are saying, I want to go sit in a class and listen to, you know, Susie's dad tell me about art history. You know, I think that's about the parents wanting it to look a certain way. And so I think it's just that stepping back, like where are our kids leading us and what does that look like? And, and what are they, what can we do to enrich their world around them at, at our home and in the world outside of our home? And so I think there's, there's a lot of those pieces. And I feel like so much of that is just letting go of this kind of cultural baggage of how it looks. And, and it's certainly understandable because most of us went to school. I certainly went to school. And, and, and so that is what I was taught learning looked like. Learning looks like sitting in a class room and somebody telling me something and then me putting it back on a test. So there is a lot to let go in that. And what I've loved is just really stepping back and watching my kids natural process as we explore the world together and learn in a way that I think adults often learn, you know, so I think we do do it as adults. Like when I want to learn about chickens, I go and I read everything about chickens and I talk to people that have chickens and I get chickens and I do it, you know, and so it, it's kind of a natural way, but, but school has gotten us away from that. So I think all those things kind of come into play as we're thinking about what does this unschooling environment look like? And for someone who's never seen it and doesn't have friends doing it, I think it's really difficult to kind of figure out what does that look like. So I can understand where, where Cheryl's coming from as they're just dabbling into this, you know, new world. That's a really great point. And that's something I emphasize a lot when I talk about de-schooling is that I think that it really helps to actually avoid class environments, mm -hmm. you know, during that time, because you need to see the natural learning in action and understand how it works. Right. And then the classroom environment just becomes another option. Exactly. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't hold that power anymore. Like this is the real way to learn. Right. And, and <laughs> by unschooling, we're like escaping that or something. No, no, this is really fully a wonderful way to learn. And classes are just, just another option on the big plate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And part of the letting go process is to let people know, I mean, not just letting go, but 
to find value in the other stuff. You know what I mean? That's that's where the focus is. The the letting go is just one thing, and then like, oh, you know, oh, what do I do? I let go. <laughs> so to <Right. laughs> to focus on seeing the value in everything in the child's life and everything the child is interested in, even the cartoons that people complain about and video games and everything else, there is so much value in all of that. And could, could I just say one thing about that lazy word that <laughs> Cause I, 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 laughed, I laughed when you brought that up. And I'm, I would, as you were talking, I was trying to get into the head of the um, person who wrote that. And I'm wondering if what she was feeling was that doing school at home was so much work, so much work, mostly because they're going against the flow of the yeah. child. They're doing school every day. They're, you know, they've got the schedule and everything. And oh my God, I, you know, I, I can feel exhausted just thinking about it, let alone actually doing it, especially um, uh, going against the child's natural spirit right. to, you know, to be free and play and learn through life. So, um, you know, to let go of that and to embrace jumping into the child's joy instead of, you know, fighting the flow and pedaling upstream, they're just flowing downstream with the child's joy now. And so hopefully that's kind of the connotation that they were saying, not so much that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They and, and I think, but, ooh, that. That just made me think, too, that, right, I think we've been taught, we've been trained that work is hard. You know, things yeah. of value are hard. You work, you toil, you do. That's kind of this cultural ideal. And so when when really the work that we're doing is so joyful and exciting and wonderful and lovely, you're thinking, ooh, this is lazy. This is something. This is not right. It's so different from what I've been told. But, you know, yeah, you exactly. we all know. And so I, I forget that people, because no, oh my gosh, work is joyful. You know, life is is joyful. I mean, we can choose joy and do. And so I think that is interesting to think about how people feel about it at first, because it may feel so different from what they've been told. Mm -hmm. And same thing yeah. when people would say, you know, you're so brave to um, right. not send your child to school. Oh, oh my God. Uh, the I can't even imagine putting my child on a school bus. I mean, to I me, know. That's not brave, but I mean, it, there's nothing brave about it. it. And I guess, I guess that's why we're called radical unschoolers because it is going against the mainstream flow. Right. But yet, it's the flow of joy and, uh, you know, just natural. It's so natural, and so for me, it's it's simply it's life. <laughs> simply mm -hmm. life. It's life. It's the flow. And and if you haven't been in the flow or you've been going against the flow, yeah, I, I mean, it may seem strange, but it's really so beautiful. <laughs> Come join us in the flow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a great way to end. <laughs> and we'll see you at the summit. Yay. 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 <laughs> Thanks very much, Anne and Anna. Thank, Thank you, you, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.